Welcome back. In the last video we talked about the case study of the kangaroo and how it changed over the last couple million years. In this video we're actually going to describe the evidence for evolution. Um, so the dot point, the syllabus dot point says describe using specific examples how the theory of evolution is supported by the following areas of study. Paleontology, including fossils that have been considered transitional forms, biogeography, comparative embryology, comparative anatomy, and biochemistry. So first, before we start, we need to make sure we know what that word theory means. A scientific theory is a bit different to a normal theory. When it comes to scientific theory, we need to make sure that there's lots of evidence that supports that theory. If there's evidence that is against the theory of evolution, then a scientist would stop believing in it. So we believe in the theory of evolution because we have a lot of evidence to support that. And these five areas are the areas that we um, have collected most of evidence and that show the strongest evidence for evolution. So I'm going to go over each one by one. The first one is the paleontolog paleontology. What paleontology is is, is the um, fossils. So looking at fossils. And one thing we've noticed with fossils is, first of all, most of our fossils are from sort of now to 500 million years ago, so most of our fossils um, either come from things that have died now or from things that have died from now between now and 500 million years ago. And the reason why is because for most fossils we need to have something that has a hard shell. So hard shells make good fossils and you can imagine before the Cambrian period, which was before this 500 million years ago, most of the animals were bacteria and bacteria don't really have a hard shell, so when they died they didn't leave a fossil. We do have some fossils of bacteria, and that's why we date the oldest living life to about 3.8 billion years ago, and because we have found some fossils preserved of these bacteria, these archaea bacteria, and we believe that the oldest living thing is 3.8 billion years ago. Okay, the majority of living things are bet between, uh, we found the majority of fossils between now and 500 million years ago. And what we've noticed is a change. So we've noticed the species changing. So for example, now we mostly have mammals and birds and insects living. So mammals are now. Beforehand it was mostly dinosaurs before the mammals started to appear in bigger numbers. Um, the dinosaurs, then we had these other animals which were all living. So here these were mostly in the sea. These fossils here, the, even the older ones again. These were sea fossils, which makes sense because we believe that most of the life was um, came from the sea before it moved onto land. Right? So with the fossil record, we basically we can track our history. And we've noticed that living things have changed a lot, so they have evolved a lot over time. And we believe that it's gone from very simple, so from our single cell bacteria about 3.8 billion years ago, to more and more complex. And depending on the environment, uh, we've get, got new species. So for example, we've had dinosaurs who were very complex already, but then the environment changed, which made other species, other um, classes of mammals and birds, made them uh, evolve more and more, because they were the most adapted to the new environment. So these fossil records allow us to have one good evidence for evolution, because they show how living things have changed over time. And they date life back to up to 3.8 Billion years. That, that's what we predict our first living thing to be in terms of age-wise. We also need to give a transitional form, and this is an interesting one. It's called the Crossopterian fish, and it appeared around about 400 million years ago. So 400 million years ago is when this Crossopterian fish started to appear in our fossil records. So we believe that it started to evolve about 400 million years ago. And the unique thing about this fish is that it could breathe oxygen. So most other fish could only get their oxygen from dissolved water, whereas this one could actually breathe oxygen in the air itself. And also it had bones in its fin. So these bones allowed it to kind of walk. You can imagine it could, could walk on land. And what we believe, um, we, this, this bone, this fish actually became, walked onto land, and some of these fish eventually turned into, these were the ancient ancestors of, of the amphibians. So amphibians are things like frogs, 
um, and similar things like frogs. And then amphibians eventually also, not changed, but some of them became reptiles, other state amphibians. And then from the reptiles, you had your birds and your mammals, which are two different lines. Right? But the idea was that basically this one was the ancient ancestor of all the vertebrates. So vertebrates are the ones which have a backbone. So this one here has its backbone, and that's vertebrate. And we believe that cross fish was the first um, transitional, so it's trans transitional means that it's gone from fish to something else. This one's the first ancestor that helped the, the animals move from the ocean in, onto land by becoming more amphibian-like. And eventually amphibians turn into reptiles, or some of the amphibians um, evolved into reptiles, and reptiles, some of the reptiles evolved into bird-like and mammal-like animals. So this happened over the course of many million years, but we believe this fish was the first to move onto land. And um, so before this, all life was in the ocean, before 400 million years ago. Second part, so this was the paleontology, so how fossil records is an evidence for evolution. The second part was the com comparative anatomy. Comparative anatomy refers to comparing the structure of bones in animals. So this is here, this is that same cross, that thing that I'm going to underline, is that same crossopitarian fish, how it has its um, fin with that, the bones. And one thing we've noticed is that all our current um, vertebrates, so our fish, and not our fish, but our reptiles, our birds, our mammals, so for example here, bird, bat, human, whale, amphibian and the reptile, have all have a very similar structure in terms of their arms. So the forearms, they have the same bones, they have the two bones and the forearm, which is the ulna and the radius. They all have five fingers. Even the bat, you don't might not think that the bat has five fingers, but its wings are its fingers. So that's comparing anatomy. We find that all of our current vertebra um, have a very similar bone anatomy, and that bone anatomy might come from that cross fish because it had that same structure. And so you, should, you should look at this word and remember this word. This is the pentaductal limbs. Penta means five. Ductal means kind of fingers or fingers or toes. And limbs refers to either legs or arms. So all of these animals that I mentioned, or classes, reptiles, mammals, birds, and amphibians, they all have five fingers, and their both their arms and legs have five fingers, legs and... Even the horse, which you might think has only one, still has five. Legs and arms, so that is one another evidence that we are all very similar, which, which kind of hints at a shared ancestry. Uh, next one was comparative embryology, so the fact that all early embryos, so if we just if we just conceived, all of the early embryos, they look very similar. So you can imagine um, a fish and a amphibian and a, and a mammal and a bird have very little in common in terms of the looks, but when it comes to that earlier stage, when they're only a couple of days old, they all look very similar. Yeah? And they even have all have gills, so why would a, a bird or a reptile why would they have gills? Um, the reason why they would have gills is because if they come from that cross fish, that cross fish, obviously it had gills. And even though these are now have evolved into different species, into different classes, they still share some of the features of the early one. So the early embryos, they have gills, but then later development, those gills go away. So obviously a bird doesn't have gills anymore. But comparing that early embryology, has given us further evidence for evolution. So these are three one, three uh, of the evidences for evolution, and I'm going to cover biogeography and biochemistry in a second as well. We're now going to cover biogeography and biochemistry in terms of how those two areas are more evidence for evolution. So first I'll start with biogeography and what that actually means. So that word biology or bio which refers to biology. So basically living things, biology, so um, the plants, animals, and other living things. And geography refers to locations. So for example, countries or continents, um, kind of location on Earth itself. Uh, so what 
biogeography is, is biogeography is the study of distribution of plants and animals. And what I mean by that is, it's if we look at, for example, Australia, which is a location, what kind of plants and animals can we find in Australia? And then we can compare a different location, so for example, Europe, that's the geography, and compare what kind of animals and plants we can find in Europe. And the study of biogeography uh, is another evidence for evolution, and I'm going to go over why in a second as well. So you can imagine we have Pangaea. Um, any, if anyone hasn't heard of Pangaea, Pangaea was a continent, so we, now we have Europe, Asia, um, Africa, different continents, but quite a, some time ago, so millions of years ago, that was just one big continent called Pangaea. So before we had a split of these continents, it was called Pangaea. Then Pangaea split into two different continents, so into halves almost, and we had Laurasia, and two different continents were part of Laurasia, that was Asia and Europe, and I think North America as well. And we also had um, Gondwana, and some of the ones which were part of it were Australia was part of Gondwana, and so was South America. Also the, the, the Antarctic and a couple other ones, but these are the ones which I'm going to go over because they're relevant for the example I'm going to bring up in a second. So we have, um, so Gondwana was a separate continent and Laurasia was a separate continent as well. And you can imagine now there might be quite a few plants and animals that were um, on Gondwana which could not mix anymore. So these two uh, species of plants and animals could not mix anymore because they were now apart. So whatever was on Gondwana would have to stay on Gondwana and whatever was on Laurasia would stay on Laurasia. But then after a while they split again. So Gondwana split into Australia and South America and Antarctic. And then this is what we have today. We have South America here. We have Australia here. Some of these other Pacific islands. But yeah, so you can imagine these were all part of that Gondwana some time ago, many millions of years ago. Um, but why I'm bringing this up is because we have this plant called the Orata, the Warata plant. And we can actually find the Warata plant here in Australia. We can find it in Australia. We can find it in South America. And we can find it on these small Pacific islands all around us as well. So basically all these plants which were part of the this um, Waratah plant would have been part of Gondwana and then split and now we can find versions of this Waratah plant on each of these separate areas but they're all different, they are slightly different so the Waratah plant in Australia is different to the Waratah plant in South America they have some similarities but they're different because they had so much time apart that they evolved into different species so even though there's Waratah, this plant we can find in Australia, South America and the Pacific Islands, they are different species now because they had so much time by themselves in isolation, so they evolved into different animals and uh, different plants, uh, even though they have, still have very few, very many similarities as well. Right? And then we also have this here as well. So this is Australia here and New, New Guinea here. These are Pacific Islands in Australia. And right close to us, close to Australia, we've got Indonesia. So in terms of kilometer distance, they're not very far apart at all. But if you look at the animals that live in Australia compared to Indonesia, so these are, you know, you've got your kangaroos and marsupials here, and they are completely different kind of animals in Indonesia. So they are very different animals that live in Indonesia um, compared to Australia. And that makes sense if you look at the continents. Laurasia was part of Asia, so Indonesia is part of Asia. And Indonesia would have split from Australia a long, long time ago, which means that the animals were not sh not same, similar at all. The ancestry was very far behind in terms of very separated. So Indonesia would have completely different types of plants and animals compared to Australia, whereas we have much more in common Australia than with South America, even though South America, distance-wise, is a huge distance away. That's because um, the the plants and animals share a common ancestor much much earlier than those of Indonesia. So both for Australia and and Australia and South America, they have evolved into different ones, but they are still a lot more similar than Australia compared to Indonesia, even though Indonesia is a lot more close to us than South America is. So that was biogeography, so the study of biological things. 
in different parts of the, of the world. An example was the water plant, how we have water plants in Australia, Indonesia, uh, sorry, Australia, South America, and some of the Pacific Islands. They're all similar, but yet different because they had enough time to evolve into different types of plants. The second part was a biochemistry. And in bio, it refers to biological, and chemistry refers to the study of chemicals. So what biochemistry actually is, is the study of chemicals that make up our body. So molecules or compounds that make up a body. And here's a couple of different ones. We've got DNA. Um, so if we make new offspring, they will have our DNA. That's basically our blueprint, our genetic code. So DNA. Hemoglobin, that was there too. So hemoglobin was to carry oxygen. DNA was our genetic code. And remember, enzymes, these were the ones who speed up chemical reactions. Now, with DNA, uh, basically every single life form on Earth, from bacteria to um, animals to plants, have the same genetic material. So they have the same bases, these nitrogenous bases, A, T, C, G, and the same idea of DNA. So all life forms have this. And they have it very similar in terms of how um, information is encoded as well. Right? So all, inf all animals and plants and bacteria have DNA and the same type of DNA as well. well many of uh, most of the uh, current vertebrates also have this hemoglobin, which is in our red blood cells. And it's basically the same structure for it. It doesn't matter what kind of um, animal it is. They have a very similar hemoglobin. So it's not just do they carry blood, but they carry blood in that same hemoglobin molecule. For, so very similar molecule for all life forms. And again, with these enzymes, so for example, the cellular respiration enzymes, they are the same for us than they are for other animals and plants. And basically anything that uses aerobic respiration, so uh, cellular respiration that requires oxygen, they all have the same enzymes as well. So this study, the study of biochemistry, which is one way of again showing that um, we all have similar things in our body. It doesn't matter if we're human or bacteria or plants that work in a very similar way. And that's another evidence that we had a shared common ancestry. Right, so I'm going to go over them again. Paleontology, that was the, the study of fossils. And we used uh, the fish the, as the example of that transitional form. Biogeography, that was a study of biological distribution in different areas. So study of plants and animals and where they're, where they're living at the moment. And we used the warata as the example. We had the comparative embryology. And then we had the pentadactyl limb, which was that five-fingered limb and how all animals, all vertebrae have that same kind of um, limb. Comparative anatomy, that was that we Actually, comparative anatomy was a pectodactyl limb, and comparative embryology was looking at embryos and how all the embryos, early, early embryo and development, when we were only a couple days old, how they all look very similar, especially for vertebra. And biochemistry was just a study of molecules in our body and how all living life forms use very similar molecules in our body for it, for it to function properly. So I hope that made sense.